Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? If you could just give me, I can't see people, but if you can all just pop in the chat, but perfect. Thank you, Kaz. I'll just give it a few more minutes and then we will uh, go into this. It'll probably be about an hour. Um, we are recording it. So if you do want to watch it again, um, you can do so. It'll be up for about a week. Uh, for those of you who are already existing Rococo clinics, we will be doing a further video on this to relate it to our products. So we have a surprise for you all on Monday, which is a good surprise. So fantastic. All right. So I'm actually, so my suggestion would be to start. I'm just going to introduce myself because not everyone actually knows me. Um, so my name is Jason Greenwood. I'm the founder of Rococo Botanicals. We started our brand about 11 years ago. Uh, I've been a therapist, skin therapist for about 27 years. I'm also a cosmetic chemist. And we started our brand because we couldn't find anything on the market that met our requirements. So I'm just gonna start, I'll see if this will, oh, slow try, play from start. So if you do have any questions, my suggestion would be to pop them in the chat box and we can come back to them later because it's much easier to continue to go uh, through the actual information rather than stop and start. And you may find any way that your questions are actually answered as we're working through the information. So why did I name my company is one of the questions. Rococo is a French style of architecture known for its elegance and refinement. And my name is apparently French. Um, Little did I know that my name was French. My grandmother thought she'd made it up and my daughter's name Corinne is French. And so it seemed apt. And we have a bit of a French heritage as well. So um, I think everyone's muted, um, Jill, so all good. So I'll, I'll leave the chat box. Hopefully it's not closing everything over here. All right. So yeah, if you have any questions, pop them in and we'll, we'll answer them at the end. I'll come back to them after I've stopped screen sharing so I can actually talk further. So has everyone actually heard of biofilms? Like, is, has everyone heard of them or no? No? Okay, great. So I'm going to take this very much back to basics because everyone has a different level of knowledge. And so for some therapists, they're quite advanced. And there are others that have just graduated where they don't know any of these things. So I implore you, if I say a terminology that you're not familiar with, please don't feel that you don't know things and you won't put your hand up because the only way you improve is if you actually ask the question. So I will try to make this as simple as possible for people. So I'll go to the next slide. All right. So originally with acne, the original theory was that it was retention hyperkeratosis and that was Dr. Fulton's theory. Now, there is retention hyperkeratosis, but what they've found is that actually inflammation is the initiating trigger. And what they're finding even more so now is that biofilms are playing a huge role in the formation of acne. It isn't a case of the proliferation of acne is the problem because believe it or not, people who don't get acne actually have more acne bacteria on their skin. So the, the normal skin has more numbers of acne bacteria, they just have different strains. And so what we're finding with the treatment of acne is it isn't about just killing off acne bacteria, it's actually about modulating the immune response of the skin. And the immune response of the skin has a lot to do with the, the formation of a thing called a biofilm. And we're going to go what into that further so you understand what they are. So Dr. Unna is a, um, a German scientist and he was the first person to actually um, isolate cornybacterium, now known as QT bacterium. They've gone through three name changes. 
And he was, he was able to isolate them from acne lesions in patients. And he was the first to establish the link between acne and a local infection. However, afterwards they discovered that these bacteria are also present on a normal skin. And so his research was sort of discredited a little bit and not taken as seriously. However, what we do know is that our acid mantle, which is responsible for keeping the pH of the skin at around approximately 5.5, is from our acne bacteria. They're digesting sebum and they're acidifying the skin. And that is what's keeping the skin healthy and preventing infection. So, Biofilms are basically a sticky uh, exoskeleton that bacteria secrete. Now, what's interesting is it's not just bacteria that secrete this. There's also fungi that secrete it. Malassezia secrete biofilms. The majority of yeasts and molds and bacteria produce them. Now, the simplest version that you can see is pond scum. It's, that is a biofilm. Another really good example is plaque on your teeth. So when you have plaque on your teeth, that is a biofilm of bacteria and they're encased in it and they are protected. So what they found is when bacteria are in a, a um, biofilm, they're actually 50 to 500 times more resistant to antibiotic treatment than if they were just like a singular cell. So a biofilm consists of hundreds and hundreds of bacteria that have grouped together. Think of it like a colony and they are protected in this exoskeleton of a, a, a sticky polysaccharide. So if you've ever had anything sticky on you and it's very difficult to get off, this is exactly what a biofilm is. Now, whilst they're in this biofilm, not only are they protected, but they can actually communicate with one another, they can change genes, they can actually even switch the type of um, bacteria that they are as well. So biofilms are involved with things such as acne. They're also involved with hydrogenitis superturva. So if you have not heard of that, it is um, when you, they also call it acne inversa and clients get, end up getting large, large cysts, generally increases like under breasts, under arms, um, in the groin, and they're quite painful and they can turn into like, um, sinus tracking in the skin and nodules as well. So that's what biofilms are. They're also involved in eczema as well. So it's not just acne that they're involved in. They're also involved in um, conditions such as cystic fibrosis, which is affecting the lungs. And that is also with biofilms as well. And biofilms are notorious in uh, medical settings because they can actually attach to devices and equipment that's used in surgery and it's really difficult for them to remove it. So just wiping something with alcohol does not remove a biofilm and neither does sterilizing it always either. They're notorious for it because all equipment is still autoclaved and yet biofilm, biofilms still persist on them. So it's a major, major problem. So biofilms actually promote the formation of comedones because they make, they're, they're covering the actual keratinocyte and it can't actually leave the follicle. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a rundown. So with acne, the more sebum you produce, the less linoleic acid, which is omega-6, is available inside the follicle wall. And omega-6 or linoleic acid is crucial. It helps to prevent microcomedones. And when you're deficient in it, you'll actually get scaling inside the actual follicle wall, which makes it all rough. Now, I want you to think of it this way. If any of you go and get your nails done, the first thing they're gonna do is they're going to file your nail plate and make it rough. Because have you ever tried sticking something to a surface that isn't, isn't um, that's completely smooth? It doesn't stick to it. So when the actual um, linoleic acid decreases because there is increased sebum, it will become rough and it makes it the perfect surface for a biofilm to attach to. Now, part of the process of treating acne should be involving reducing sebum 
because the, the more you reduce that, the more linoleic acid will be available and the less it's likely to scale inside the follicle and the harder it will be for the biofilm to actually attach. So that's part of a methodology of, of treating acne in particular. So the term biofilm was first used in the 70s and it was uh, termed by Costerton and Chang. So there are three things that are required for biofilm formation. So one, you need a microbial cell. Um, two, you need a surface for the cells to adhere to because if they don't have anything to adhere to, they can't actually then form a colony. And the third is an extracellular polymer polymeric matrix and they embed onto it and can form large communities. They're notoriously resistant to antimicrobial therapies due to res restricted penetration and decreased growth rate. They also express resistance genes and the presence of resistant cells. So this is where um, antibacterial resistance comes in when you actually have these types of cells. So there's different, there's different forms of them. You've got plank planktonic, which is a single cell. You've got, with a planktonic cell, there's, they're literally singular. They're not actually communicating with anyone. They've got a high metabolism. They've got high motility, which means they can move really well. They've got low virulence, which means they don't cause a lot of inflammation in the skin, and they're susceptible to antibiotics. You're, once they're encased in a biofilm, they have phenotypic diversity, which means they can actually change form. Um, so they, they may be one form of acne bacteria and then they can change to a more virulent one depending on what is required. So they're multitaskers. They also have a low metabolism. So they don't require a lot of um, nutrients basically. And they have low motility. They're pretty much staying where they are. They also have extremely high attachment because they're actually encased in that biofilm and they're antibiotic resistant and they're virulent. And the more virulent they are, the more inflammation they're going to create. And that inflammatory um, release is going to cause um, scarring. It's going to cause a destruction of the dermal matrix. And you end up finding that you end up having acne back in the same spot again. So if you've ever had a pimple like on your chin or somewhere else and you go, why am I getting it back in the same spot? I'm telling you it's partly because of biofilms and it's partly because the dermis is degraded. And acne bacteria go to where it's the path of least resistance, but also too, because biofilms are notoriously difficult to remove, even when you think you've got rid of it, it can regrow. And I can tell you that um, this is absolutely the case. Last year during uh, COVID, I ended up developing seborrheic dermatitis and it is the most resistant microorganism to get rid of that I've ever seen with melesthesia. Um, and we'll go into that in further detail. Melesthesia also play a role in the formation of acne. So it's not just acne bacteria. So when you're treating acne, you absolutely have to have some antifungal component in there because if you don't, you're actually allowing the acne to continue. They can also alter when they're in this process um, gene expression as well. So they literally have the ability to communicate with one another. So acne bacteria also have what's known as an efflux, efflux pump. So you've got cells or bacteria that are extremely resistant. And these are the ones that cause antibiotic resistance. And they're called persister cells. Now, in some studies, they've found that they're actually sort of dormant. And then others, they've found that they're active. But what they do know is that when the um, cell wall is exposed to antibiotics, it has the ability to pump it directly out of the cell again, making sure that it doesn't have any effect on the, on the actual um, bacteria itself. So because of its ability to do this, it makes it incredibly difficult sometimes to kill off acne bacteria. Now, there are actors that actually will disable efflux pumps. And the reason why antibiotics work is because that's actually what they're doing. So antibiotics are inhibiting that efflux pump over time and they have to break through the, the biofilm first, but they do have the capacity to actually 
reduce that efflux pump and allow the bacteria bacteria side to actually get in. So your persisters are a subpopulation of non-growing bacteria, and they can survive in high concentrations of um, antibiotics, basically. So with this um, ability to survive in high concentrations, you have to do um, antibiotic therapy if a doctor is doing it for an extremely long period of time. Now, the challenge with that is, is long-term antibiotic therapy has its downside. Um, not only does it actually change the gut microbiome, it's also changing the skin microbiome, but it also can affect the liver and the kidney. And I say this because my son had been on antibiotics for three years unbeknownst to me because he doesn't live with me and he now has liver damage. So, you know, we're in the, the process of trying to get him off that. So don't think that antibiotics long term don't have any side effects. They actually do. But these persister cells are one of the main reasons for antibiotic treatment failure and for bacterial infections that just seem to keep coming back. Um, Ellen's just raised her hand. Let me just find you again, Ellen. Oh, oh, no, it's gone. Ellen, if you can save your question or write it down for the end, because I'm having trouble because I've only got one screen. So here we've actually got the growth of an actual biofilm. So initially you've got here just your singular cell and it's transporting and it's attaching but it's not really, it's, it's just singularly attached. They're easy to remove and they're not virulent at this stage. So they're not causing response in the immune system. So once it grows to a certain point, you'll start to get what's known as EPS, which is the um, polysaccharide that's produced by the bacteria. And then that will start to encase the bacteria, literally forming like a force shield within it. Once it actually grows to enough density, you then get quorum sensing happening as well. So quorum sensing is basically the ability for the uh, bacteria to communicate with one another. So what they're basically doing is they can detect changes in the pH, they can detect changes in temperature, um, they can detect if there's an antimicrobial that's being attempted to be used on them, and they literally communicate with one another to mount an attack to prevent it from happening. So quorum sensing is another way that you can actually target acne uh, in particular, because if you actually target quorum sen sensing, you're actually ripping out literally their internet. They cannot communicate if they can't quorum sense. So, and part of that is decreasing the actual biofilm formation. And also you can prevent the biofilm from attaching as well, which helps to aid in preventing acne. Then once it reaches a certain point, it's actually going to burst because it can't keep it in there any longer. Now, those ones that are actually released then spread to other areas, which is how acne can actually spread to surrounding tissue, surrounding area. And again, some of those cells are persister cells. So they're, they're being released and they're attaching somewhere else. And even though you're hitting them with an antimicrobial or an antibiotic, nothing is actually occurring. Um, can everyone else see the screen? I'm just checking. Elaine, I'm not sure. Yep, everyone else can see it. I'm not sure why you're not seeing it. Maybe your settings. Okay, perfect. Um, you will be able to watch the replay. So um, that way you can actually get the information and you'll be able to see all the slides. So your biofilms are involved in the pathogenesis of your original um, acne lesion, which is your microcomedone. So for those of you who aren't aware, microcomedones are invisible. So you cannot see them by looking under a magnifying lamp. You can't see them with the naked eye. The only way that you see them is through a biopsy or putting a cryo glue on the skin and actually taking a sample. So it's impossible to see. So when your acne clients say that they're getting um, breakouts within like a week or two or blackheads or close comedones, they take months to form. So it is most likely something that's under the skin that's actually coming up. 
So when they're in this um, biofilm, they're in a distinct metabolic state and they can actually change phenotypes or types of bacteria when they're in this actual state. So they literally can morph. Um, you can't see a biofilm again by examination. Uh, you have to actually do specific uh, tests to be able to see if there is actually a biofilm. How the, however, the majority of acne clients do have biofilms on their skin. So the biofilm acts like a biological glue that increases the cohesiveness between your keratinocytes and it provides a medium for the uh, acne bacteria to remain attached to the follicle wall. It also prevents the, um, the hyperkeratitic plug from actually being released from the top of the mouth of the follicle as well. And so as it's expanding its contents, eventually it's gonna rupture and that's actually gonna activate your toll-like receptors, which are involved in the major inflammatory pathway of acne. So I'm just gonna quickly go through toll-like receptors because I'm sure that most people actually don't know what they are. Toll-like receptors are involved in your innate immune response. And so basically what they do is our, our actual um, skin or our body has like a Google database of bacteria and microbes and viruses. And so when you actually come into um, contact with something for the first time and your body doesn't know what to do with it, it puts it into one section where it will just mount a very generalized immune response because it doesn't know how to deal with it because it doesn't know what it is. So it's sort of just, just generally mounting a, a um, response to it to try to squish whatever it is. Once it's actually isolated what it is and it's worked out, okay, it's an acne bacteria or it's a virus or it's the flu or whatever it is, it then mounts a very specific response, which is much more laser targeted. And that's your adaptive immune system. So your toll-like receptors are activated with your innate immune response. So if you're constantly having it um, released, it will cause things like inflammation, it will cause slow healing in wounds and things as well. It's also responsible in part for um, your scarring that happens because once your toll-like receptors are activated, you'll also get the release of your matrix metalloproteinases, which are enzymes that actually digest your collagen and your elastin. And that makes the actual um, surrounding tissue very, very fragile. Um, okay, I was just checking that message. So, Next one. So as I said, your bacteria can actually change phenotypes. And I've put mystique up here because that's for anyone who's ever watched um, any of the shows, you will be aware she can change form. And that's literally what bacteria can do for acne. They can actually change into different forms depending upon what the community needs to actually keep itself alive, basically. So there are three main acne phylotypes. So 1A, 1B, 2, and 3. So they've done studies on acne biofilms with acne-affected um, sebaceous follicles, and they were composed of 1A and 2, and these were shown to express a compound called Christy Atkins Munch Peterson or CAMP1 factor. So CAMP factor is toxic to keratinocytes and macrophages, and it can produce an inflammatory reaction in vivo through the binding of toll-like receptors. So what they also know is these actual bacteria produce another substance called dermatin sulfate binding protein or DSBP for short. Now, what it actually does is it binds up dermatine sulfate and dermatine sulfate is a natural um, moisturizing factor of the skin, also known as a glycosaminoglycan. Now, the thing with it is, is it's involved with wound repair. So if you bind it, it literally stops the skin from being able to heal properly. And remembering when acne bacteria are in a biofilm, which they are in the case with acne, it amplifies the immune response quite dramatically. 
Also, while um, you've got your biofilm, there are other adhesion proteins that exist within the biofilm, and they promote attachment of the bacteria and cause acne to progress into a chronic disease. So bacterial lipases are upregulated in the biofilm, and it causes increased levels of free fatty acids. And these free fatty acids are inflammatory, and they then, um, it's from the hydrolysis of the sebum that this occurs. And this also enhances the acne bacteria ability to adhere to the actual pilosebaceous unit wall. So that's part of it as well. So here we've got a slide of your different um, phylotypes of acne. So you've got different strains, R21, R22, R23, R24, R25, R26, R27, R29, and R210. So the one on the left here is normal skin. Now, what you'll see by the image is that there is a difference in the ratio of bacteria. And there are some strains of bacteria that do not even exist on a normal skin, but they are on a acne skin which is um, why you have an inflammatory response for it. And then you've got your acne biofilm forming as well. So what they found with it is that R2, 4, 5, and 10 are highly virulent. So I'm just gonna go back to this slide here and they're resistant to antibiotics that also the dominant phylotypes on an acne patient's skin. So these ones here are to four, five, and six, which is black, yellow, and green are the, the main ones. Now, if you actually look over here, you'll see that there's absolutely no RT5 at all on a normal skin. And there's very little of the R24 as well. So it's not about the number of acne bacteria. It's about the different strains that are there. And also the fact that those strains in particular are activating the immune response. And the more immune response you have in the skin, the worse the scarring tends to be and the longer the inflammatory process. So they've actually shown that the more the inflammation stays, the worse the scarring is basically. So biofilms, delay wound healing. So this was a concept that I toyed with about 18 months ago. And then I started doing more research on it. And they've known for ages that biofilms delay wound healing. Um, I've got a medical background, I'm an ex-nurse, and I have had to debride wounds before. And when you have chronic wounds, they end up getting biofilms in there and the biofilms will actually form a like, a gel gelatinous coating on the actual wound, and it actually prevents it from healing properly. Now, the reason why it prevents it from healing properly is because whatever bacteria are in there, when they're encased in a biofilm, it actually amplifies all of the inflammation for a start. And wounds can't heal in an inflamed environment. It also makes them resistant to antibiotic therapy as well. But the biggest thing is it actually causes the release of matrix metalloproteinases or MMPs. And MMPs are responsible for wound remodeling, but when they're in abundance, they actually delay wound healing because they're actually stopping collagen and elastin from being laid down and the wound from actually being remodeled properly. So biofilms typically will delay wound healing. Now you can have a major wound where that's quite visible, or you can have an acne lesion where you're not necessarily seeing it, However, the traditional approach for actually treating acne has always been to dry it out. And so when you actually use things like benzoyl peroxide, even though they know that they've got antimicrobial activity, benzoyl peroxide doesn't actually do anything for biofilms. There's studies out there that have shown that they only have an effect when they're combined with an antibiotic. So just pure benzoyl peroxide by itself does absolutely nothing for biofilm and removing it or breaking it. However, what it does is it changes the actual status of the actual follicle and it reduces the amount of water content that is available. And so what you end up finding is that the skin actually tends to dry out and 
the thing with scarring is nothing heals in a dry environment. If you were to go to a hospital setting and you look at what they're using for treating wounds, it's always alginate dressings. It's always moist dressings. It's the principle of a Band-Aid. A Band-Aid is occlusion and cre creates a moist environment for skin to heal. So if you're drying out acne, you're actually preventing healing, basically, and allowing it to heal much quicker. So one of the supplements that is often recommended for acne is DIM. So DIM comes from your cruciferous vegetables, um, things like kale, spinach um, as well. So there was a study that actually looked at DIM supplementation and DIM at 0.1 millimetres or 32 milligrams per mil significantly inhibited planktonic cell growth and biofilm formation by your sea acnes. Now, it also, when they went on to further test it, inhibited multiple species of biofilm formation, including sea acnes, your staph aureus, aureus and candida albicans. Now, for many of you who've been dealing with acne for a long time, Candida is one of those things that you see quite often on an acne skin. And as I said before, you know, fungal infections are a part of acne. They're not separate. So this whole thing of fungal acne, it just is the fungal is actually more prevalent and you can see it. But all acne has malassezia involvement. In fact, they've actually done um, studies and when they've actually um, had a look at it, there's nearly a hundred times more ability to upregulate um, sebum with yeast than there is with bacteria. So malassezia cause more havoc with acne, back, with acne skins than often the acne bacteria themselves. So what are some of the ways that you can actually help with disrupting um, the, the actual biofilm? So believe it or not, galvanic is one of them. And it's something that we've done for years. Now, I've done it because it actually helps to melt the microcomedone. The formation of lye occurs when you do this process, and that literally does dissolve microcomedones. But what's actually interesting is that bacterial cell walls have membrane potentials, and they're affected by electric current. So when you apply electricity externally, it affects the alpha helix content and the orientation of the bacterial membrane proteins. And electric fields and currents can influence the organization of the membrane, the shape of the cell, the cell behavior, and the dimensions of the actual uh, biofilm. So directional growth in response to electric fields is well known. The antibacterial activity of electric current has been previously demonstrated against normal flora on human skin. So they've done studies in this. And the mechanism of antibacterial activity against normal flora has been suggested to result from the production of, uh, when, when you have electrolysis, uh, oxidizing radicals, chlorine molecules, and hydrogen peroxide, which results as a consequence of it. This actually caused a membrane damage leading to leakage of the cytoplasm and it decreases bacterial respiratory rate. So it also generates oxygen and the bioelectric effect is also, can also deliver oxygen to the biofilm, remembering that um, acne bacteria don't like oxygen. They can live in it, but they don't like it. And that can help overcome the actual biofilm mass and cell wall barriers, as well as increase the metabolic activity and growth rate. So reduced antimicrobial microbial susceptibility, I can't say that, susceptibility of biofilm bacteria has been associated with localized oxygen depletion and within biofilms and an increased expression of extracellular polysaccharide, which causes it to actually adhere. So oxygen can um, enhance the susceptibility of the biofilm, making it less able to actually stay there. So this is your malassezia. Um, what it'll actually look like on a slide. And as I said, it, it is actually heavily involved in the formation of acne. It's not just acne bacteria. It's just a question here. <laughs> I'm glad you're enjoying it, Ginny. <laughs> um, 
So this is actually my next picture is actually galvanic. So I actually did this treatment. This is my photo. Um, I did this about oh, about 15 months ago now. Uh, this was one of our clients. Now, she was actually coming in because she had congestion. And this is the response with two galvanic treatments. So the reason why I'm showing you this is because obviously there's a clearance of the congestion, but have a look at the scarring. Have a look at the reduction in the pore size and have a look at the general change of the skin. Now, this was in a period of about a month. So I don't have any doubt for a second that biofilms are delaying wound healing and acne and stopping the skin from repairing. Because if you give the skin the right things, it technically should be able to heal almost perfectly. It won't be completely perfect because once something is damaged, it will never go back to fully what it was. But this was the difference within two treatments with Galvanic. Now, nothing else was changed because she was already on the products. It's just the Galvanic that made a huge difference. The next thing I want to talk about with biofilms is a compound called phytosphingosine. Now, phytosphingosine is not only antibacterial, it's antimicrobial, it's anti-inflammatory, and it massively reduces interleukin 1A by nearly 78%. Now, interleukin 1A is one of the primary causes for hyperproliferation of your keratinocytes, and that will cause clogging of the follicles. But what I want you to look at is the image on the left. And I mentioned BPO before and how it dries the skin out. Can you see how much scarring is still left there? And it doesn't do anything for biofilms. But guess what does? Phytosphingosine. Phytosphingosine actually prevents and helps to eliminate biofilms. And look at the photo on the right when you're still using benzoyl peroxide, but you also have something in there to help eradicate biofilms. There is a dramatic difference in the texture of the skin, as well as the actual marks and scarring associated with it after. Um, so Elaine's asked, is it true that we cannot change the pore size that what we can't change is the skin type. So Elaine, I can tell you for pore size, absolutely you can change pore size. And we will go into this in more depth next week because I will be doing a webinar with um, our Rococo clinics. So pore size is related to three things. It's related to sebum production. So if you decrease sebum production, you will decrease pore size. It's also related to a loss of um, collagen in the surrounding tissue. So as we age, our pores can look bigger. So if you are stimulating collagen, either via um, modalities that you're doing, whether that be microneedling, whether that be LED, whether that be microcurrent or some other means, they will shrink. One of the biggest reasons that um, you can get pores is because when your, um, your corneocytes are going up, as they reach the top of the surface of the skin, they haven't differentiated properly and they're not meant to have a, a nucleus and they do. So when you look at the cells on people who've got enlarged pores, they've still got the nucleus in the cell and they shouldn't have it, which means differentiation isn't happening properly. They're not going through the mechanical process that they're meant to. And again, that can be controlled um, topically by active ingredients to ensure that you actually get proper differentiation of keratinocytes. Um, yeah, I'm with you, Jill, on the galvanic sometimes. I can't do galvanic anymore because I've got metal in my body, um, but it's, it's, it's a great alternative for, you know, for those who've got really, really severe um, breakouts. So your finest finger scene on the right here, you can see there's a, a, a massive difference and still using benzoyl peroxide. And then you've just got phytosphingosine. And you can see with the placebo, they've still got marks. But when you look at the other side, most of those marks have gone. So, and again, I say this because phytosphingosine actually reduces the uh, biofilm burden and it helps to remove it and eradicate. And on top of that, it also has antibacterial and antifungal effects as well. And as I said, like fungal is, is part of, um, the formation of acne. It's not just acne bacteria. Um, 
Laura Lee, the products that contain phytosphingosine and rococo are our eruption emulsion in particular. Um, it is also in our ceramide booster, but it is not in a therapeutic percentage because it's part of a compound. Um, you actually do need to use it at 0.2%, and that is the percentage that is in our eruption emulsion cream. So that is the only product that actually has it in, um, and we've deliberately done that for that reason. So again, this is actually with a solution that actually flushes the pores out and removes biofilm. It's a biological surfactant that's derived from yeast. Now, this is two treatments. So you can see already there's a reduction in this scar here and just a general evenness of your rolling scars here that are happening they're all disappearing. They're all historical. Now, this is actually my daughter. Um, she has polycystic ovaries. And whilst these photos were being taken, she was actually pregnant. Um, and she also then got gestational diabetes. So um, it was very difficult with her because we can't do galvanic on her because she's pregnant. So we um, have a hydro solution that we used with her. And this was the difference with it. But again, I'm just showing you what removing the biofilm actually does for acne. It allows the skin to actually heal properly. And again, nothing changed with what she was doing for her home care. She was using the exact same products. All we've done is help to remove the biofilm and it's starting to heal. Now, she had these treatments done, um, it was fortnightly, and this was after the fifth treatment. Now, she hasn't had these done now for over six months and her skin hasn't regressed. It hasn't like it's gone back to the first photo where she suddenly got scars again. It's actually stayed like that in the last photo. It's actually clearer now because she's not pregnant anymore. Um, but yeah, it's not like it's going to regress afterwards because once that skin's healed, it's not like wrinkles where that's a biological aging process. Um, so the question is, can I utilize the solution without the machine? Um, you can try, Loralee, but I don't know um, that it works as well. Um, we tried it without it. It's more of a flushing into the, into the skin. But I'll cover that more next week with you because we've, we have got other solutions for that as well for you guys. So you won't be sort of like, what else can I do? the next one so um if anyone has got any questions could you pop them up now for those of you that are um not a rococo clinic um if you would like to learn more about how you can treat acne successfully how you can help to remove biofilms help with the scarring as well, minimising inflammation. Uh, if you would like to um, email us at wholesale at rococo.com or if you do want to pop your um, details in the chat box, we're more than happy to contact you directly as well. You will get an email from us post-webinar um, just to um, say hello. And if you are interested, we're not going to spam you. That's not our style. But if you are interested in taking it further, then we would love to hear from you. Um, Jill, you've just asked, and it's at the right percentage. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, Angela, a good galvanic device, um, I would suggest getting in contact with um, Jen Buker, uh, who is in the Rococo group. Um, Jen Buker is, she actually imports devices as well, and she has one in the USA that she has used. We originally were recommending one, and to be honest, it was from a supplier overseas, and then the one we bought was great, and then the next one wasn't, which is why I hesitate with recommending equipment anymore, but um, the company that Jen's getting hers from is from Canada. Um, so the pumpkin enzyme, you've lost me, Jill. Um, the pumpkin enzyme doesn't have anything for biofilms in there, to my knowledge. It, it's basically an enzyme that you can use. So um, thank you, Tricia. I will um, send you an email. Um, 
Okay, so Angela said she uses Equipro and that's better than the one I have. So that might be a good one. So, oh, pumpkin has finest finger seen. There you go. Uh, it probably will not be in the same percentage as the eruption emulsion. It's probably more from a ceramide um, area as well. So <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Um, does anyone have any other questions? I'm going to quickly jump into the Rococo Stockist group after and just do a live for those of you who are on the call. So if you do want to join me after. Um, so Ginny said, so what would be a good resource for learning to learn everything that you're teaching so I can understand everything you're actually saying? Um, Ginny, we're going back into educating more. So, um, you know, like with Rococo. So I'm actually, yeah, acne cytokine, absolutely. You'll get a lot more in depth, but I'm going back into educating more uh, because I've had almost like quite a bit of time off with um, surgeries and stuff. So I'm sort of getting back to normal, which is fantastic. So our plan is to do regular education every month now. So that way you can ask your questions and anything that you're sort of querying as well. Thank you, Jill. Yeah, I miss educating as well. So, um, so yes, um, wonderful. I'm going to um, end the video now. The recording will be up for a week. And um, I'm going to go into um, the Rococo group now for those girls and give you a bit of a, a lead in to what we're doing. And thank you all for joining us and giving up your time. It's my Sunday here. And um, yeah, look forward to catching up with you all again soon. We will be having another webinar in about a month. And that webinar is going to be specifically on barrier repair and the role things like filigram play and how skin should actually be um, forming and going through the layers and why barrier repair doesn't always work for everything in the skin, like why you need a different approach with seborrheic dermatitis, why it doesn't work for rosacea. Um, and so therefore we're going to be going through that and what you actually need to be doing with it. So... Thank you guys. Have a lovely evening.